All right, here are some solutions from today's worksheet. Um, work deals with continuity. So the basic idea with continuity is a function is, I don't know, discontinuous or not continuous anywhere it jumps. And that's really vague, so it helps to have a more precise definition. And it turns out that limits provides a precise definition. So all it says that a function is continuous at any point you want, whatever you're talking about, C, if, and only if, the limit when you get really close to C from the left was the exact same as the limit when you get really close to C from the right, which is the exact same as the height of your function at the point C. Which kind of makes sense um, once you understand exactly what these things mean, but I thought it might help to have a little example to talk through it so you can see how this weird mathematical statement implies continuity. So what we're doing here is this picture right here, if I just gave you this picture and I said, where's this thing discontinuous? You might say, when x equals zero, looks like it kind of jumps from here all the way up to here. And then again at 2 because there's this weird open circle here, and that probably has something to do with something. Um, and then at 4, it jumps from down here way the hell up here. And then again at 6, like it goes from here, jumps down, and jumps back up. So you might think that it's discontinuous at these points, and you'd be 100% correct. And you might just say that because of jumps or because of using words like I did. But if you wanted something more mathematically precise, you can go about it this way. So if you want to check for continuity at 6... What you want to do is figure out the limit when x approaches 6 from the left. So the limit when x approaches 6 from the left, you're thinking you're at an x coordinate just slightly less than 6. So in our picture right around here maybe, I don't want to keep drawing those people every single time. Maybe I'll just put a little, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. I'll draw the person, fine. Um, and this person's height appears to be really close to 6. Coincidentally, the x and the y coordinates are the same. So this y coordinate appears to be getting really, really close to 6 when you come at it from the left side. Um, and when you come at it from the right side, now we're slightly greater than 6. So now we're talking about this guy in red right here. Um, but he's also approaching a height of 6. You might be like, wait, those are the same. Doesn't that mean it's continuous? No, it does not. Because to be continuous, all three of these guys must be the same. And f of 6 is not 6. It looks like it's 4 in this picture. Um because this point right here is what you're interested in when you put 6 into this function, and that point 4 comes out. So you get these three values, these three values are not all the same, so it's not continuous. I won't go through the rest of them in that detail, I'll just kind of talk you through them right quick. Um, so when you approach 4 from the negative side, so now I'm talking about, I don't know what height that is, maybe a half, a quarter, something like that. Some number pretty close to 0. Um, what about when you approach 4 from the positive side? Now I'm way the hell up here. Looks like that's got a height of about 4. So these two differ. I already know that it's going to be discontinuous at this point. Um, it asked me f of 4, so I might as well figure it out since this circle right here is closed in. This would be 1 fourth. These two are the same, but this is different, not continuous. Uh, approaching 2 from the negative side. So it looks like our height is whatever this height is. Maybe that's, I don't know, a half. What about from the positive side, typo? That should have been a little plus right there. Uh, from the positive side, yeah, the height's right around the same. Looks like it's one half. But what about f of two? Well, f of two is undefined. Why is f of two undefined? Because if you try to put two into this function, there is no height associated with two. This is an open circle. This point's not on the graph. It's undefined. One half is not the same as undefined or discontinuous at that point. Finally, zero. Zero from the, another typo. Zero from the left side. Um, I don't know, negative infinity maybe? It looks to me like we have a vertical asymptote. Uh, this continues down forever. It's a little bit hard to see. It's not the greatest picture in the world. But maybe if it looked more like that, we'd be able to tell that from the left we approach negative infinity. But from the right, it looks like we go up towards infinity. So already those aren't the same. f of 0 is undefined, which is certainly not the same as infinity or negative infinity. i got three different things here. So it's discontinuous at 0 also. Finally, it says show continuity. we got continuity at x equals negative 1. So I'm talking about at this point right here. It looks like my function is continuous at that point. Um, it doesn't jump or anything. And we can verify that. The limit as x approaches negative 1 from the negative side uh, it looks like if I'm coming in this direction, the height would be about negative 1. 
If I'm coming from the positive side, maybe these aren't all typos. Maybe I just can't read them. Maybe those are supposed to be pluses. There should be a plus there. Now it's negative one. And f of negative one is negative one, all the same, so it's continuous. Okay, second page of the worksheet. What it's getting at here is, yeah, you can use limits to determine continuity, that's true. But a more useful purpose, for our class anyways, is to use continuity to determine the limits, not to use the limits to determine the continuity. That's what we're doing on this page. And so I'll let you read through all this stuff. Um, I'll just work them out. In this first problem, we're trying to figure out the limit as x approaches 3 of this mess right here. And what you can do is note that that limit is the exact same as the limit as x approaches 3 of x minus 3 times 2x plus 1 divided by x minus 3. Where'd that 2x plus 1 come from? If you FOIL x minus 3 times 2x plus 1, you'll get 2x squared minus 5x minus 3. So if you factor this thing, you can get here. Um, how'd I do that so quick? Well, I knew the answer, but generally speaking, there's ways you can factor. Maybe I should show you somewhere. Factor quadratic trinomials when the leading coefficient is not a 1. But there's kind of a shortcut, too. You know this x minus 3 has to cancel out. So there must be an x minus 3 up in the numerator. Right? So you know that this must factor into x minus 3 times something else. All you got to do is figure out that something else. Well, to figure out that something else, there's something I'm going to write here. And when I FOIL things all out, I get a 2x squared. So the 2x times this x gives me 2x squared. This must have been a 2x here. And must end up with negative 3 here. So this must be a plus 1, because plus 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. And then if you combine the outer and the inner sums, you get negative 5x. The reason you did that factoring is because now you can factor out the x minus 3s and get 2x plus 1. Oh, right, because this is the exact same as 2x plus 1? No, actually. Um, you might think that this is the exact same as 2x plus 1, but it's not. Uh, if you evaluate this at 3, you get undefined. If you evaluate this at 3, you don't get undefined. So actually, this is not the same as this, but the limit as x approaches 3 of this is the same as the limit as x approaches 3 of this. So that's why it's really important to leave this limit as x approaches 3, to rewrite that in every line. A lot of people don't like doing that. Frankly, I don't like doing that. But without that, you have an equal sign that's not valid. This is not the same as this. It's very similar, but it's not the exact same, because if you stick a 3 in here, you get a different answer as if you stick a 3 in there. The advantage of this form is that this is a continuous function. Um, it's a linear function. It's continuous. I can evaluate the limit of a continuous function by just figuring out what is the height of the function at that point. All I'm saying is going back up here, if a function is continuous, these limits are the exact same as f of c. It's the exact same if you just put that point into the function, if it's continuous. Because this is continuous, I can just take the 3 and put it into the function and get 2 times 3 plus 1, which is equal to 7, which is my answer. All right, next one. Same basic idea here, except now it's the limit as x approaches negative 2. You'd like to just change all the x's into negative 2's, but you can't because this function is not continuous. How do I know it's not continuous? Try plugging in negative 2 every time you see an x. You'll get something that's undefined. There's a hole at that point in the graph. We have something that kind of looks like this guy here, except it's at negative 2. And so what we do is we find a similar function that's continuous. And with that similar function, uh, we'll evaluate the limit. So what I'm going to have to do here is this x plus 2 must cancel with an x plus 2 in the numerator. So I already know that it factors into x plus 2 times something else. To figure out that something else, you've got a few options. You can use synthetic long division. You can use polynomial long division. Um, what a lot of people try to do is factor by grouping because they saw four terms. That's a good strategy. In this specific problem, this one won't factor by grouping. You can try it. It just doesn't work out. Um, I kind of like just doing this guess and check thing. I don't know if you'll like this. I know there must be an x squared because I end up with x cubed. An x squared times x gives me the x cubed. I know there must be a plus 4 at the end because this 4 times this 2 gives me this 8. And now i got to figure out how do I end up with a 5x squared and a 10x. Well, let's focus on the 10x. I got this 4 times this x gives me 4x. So I need 6 more x. If I, had, I could get 6 more x if this middle term were 3x because this 3x times this 2 will give me the 6x that I need. Um, so you can kind of talk, and the 5x squared works out also. Um, x squared 
times 2 gives me 2x squared, and 3x times x gives me 3 more x squared, I get 5x squared total. So if you don't want to use polynomial long division, you can talk yourself into these factorings because you know there must be an x plus 2. This is equal to the limit as x approaches negative 2 of x squared plus 3x plus 4. This is continuous. It's a polynomial. Um, I can evaluate the limit of a continuous function by just evaluating the function at that point. It's just a fancy way of saying change all the x's into negative 2's. Uh, 4 times 6 plus 4 sounds like 2 to me. All right, 4 and 4 is 8 minus 6 gives me 2. I think this limit right here is just 2. Uh, this one, the trick that you will do whenever you see kind of fractions inside fractions is, yeah, try changing all the x's into 0. It won't work. You'll be dividing by 0. This function is not continuous. Big surprise. However, I can find a similar function that is continuous. And the trick is to make this all one fraction up here in the numerator. So the least common denominator for that fraction would be 2 times 2 plus x. And so to make this one 2 times 2 plus x, I'll multiply the top and the bottom by 2 plus x. To make this 2 times 2 plus x, I'll multiply the top and the bottom by 2. And I really should have written limit here. Limit as x approaches 0 of this thing divided by x. And that's equal to the limit as x approaches 0. Make sure you include these limits. You'll lose a half a point or something on the quiz and you'll be angry because you'll think it's stupid. And I'm not saying it's not. Um, I have a common denominator right here. I can add the numerators. 2 plus x minus 2 is just x. I'll write it. 2 plus x minus 2 divided by 2 times 2 plus x all divided by x which I'm going to write as x over 1. And the reason I'm going to do that is now I can say it's the limit as x approaches 0 of, up top here I just got an x. Here I have 2 times 2 plus x. And then if I want to divide by x over 1, that's the same as multiplying by 1 over x. And what I can now do is cancel out these x's and get that this is the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over 2 times 2 plus x. I can evaluate this function because this function is continuous at the point where x equals 0. Um, and the way I evaluate it is just by changing all the x's into zeros. And I get 1 divided by 2 times 2, which is 1 fourth, which is my answer. Um, square root problems. The square root problems, there's a trick. And there's no reason you should know this trick except that I told you right here. And the trick is you're always going to multiply by the conjugate. So what I'm going to do right here is I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by the square root of x plus 2. Not the square root of x minus 2, the conjugate of that, the square root of x plus 2. And what that gives me is the limit as x approaches 4 of, if you FOIL the top, square root of x times square root of x is x, square root of x times 2 is 2 root x, but negative 2 times the square root of x is negative 2 root x, so those cancel each other out. And then negative 2 times positive 2 is minus 4. you may have noticed is something that's really nice. x minus 4 and x minus 4 cancel each other out. So this is just the limit as x approaches 4 of 1 divided by the square root of x plus 2. I can evaluate that limit because this as a function is continuous at the point x equals 4. So I just change all the x's into 4's and I get 1 divided by the square root of 4 plus 2 which is 1 over 2 plus 2. 1 over 2 plus 2, which is 1 over 4. Uh, this one, same basic idea, except now the conjugate is the square root of x minus 1 plus 2. Uh, I better make sure I do the same thing to the top and the bottom so I don't change the value of that fraction. Whoa, wait, wait, wait. You changed this minus to a plus, but you didn't change this one? Why shouldn't this be a plus 2? No, because you view this all as one term. This is one thing here. And so what I have here is one thing minus one other thing. So it's conjugate will be that first thing plus the second thing you get here. Uh, and then you go through the exact same steps you did over here. You get the limit as x approaches 5 of the square root of x minus 1 times the square root of x minus 1 is just x minus 1. The square root of x minus 1 times 2 
is two of these square root of x minus one things. However, negative two times the square root of x minus one is negative two of these square root of x minus one things. And those cancel each other out. Negative two times positive two is minus four. What you might notice is that a wonderful thing just happened. In the top I have x minus five, and the bottom I have x minus five. So I can cancel those out. And get that this is one over the square root of x plus one plus two. And this is a limit I can evaluate. That's a minus there, just bad handwriting. Shoot, that's supposed to be a minus right there, which means this should be a minus right here. Let me try to clean that up a little. I guess. Um, sorry about that. That should have been a minus, so that carries down here. And now when you evaluate the limit, things work out. You get 1 over the square root of 4 plus 2. Coincidentally, the same thing as what I had over there. You get 1 fourth. Um, okay, finally, number 6 here, absolute values. Whenever you see an absolute value, what you're going to want to do is evaluate a two-sided limit. So we'll first figure out the limit as x approaches, sorry, change this two-sided limit into two one-sided limits. So the limit as x approaches 10 from the positive side of this mess. And then later I'll figure out the limit as x approaches 10 from the negative side of this mess. And the way I'll do that is if x is approaching 10 from the positive side, I know that x is a little bit bigger than 10. And if I have something a little bigger than 10 and I take away 10, I have a positive number. And that's key because if you have the positive number that you're taking the absolute value of, the absolute value doesn't do anything at all. Right? The absolute value of positive 3 is just positive 3. If the absolute value is not doing anything at all, I don't even need to write it. I get that this is the limit as x approaches 10 from the positive side of just x minus 10 over x minus 10. I don't need that absolute value anymore because what's inside the absolute value is positive. x minus 10 over x minus 10, that cancels out. I get that this is the limit as x approaches 10 from the positive side of the number one. Well, the number one is always the number one. I don't care what x is getting close to. Uh, that's just equal to one. All right, there's my, an well, kind of. That's my answer to this question. What about when x approaches 10 from the negative side? Well, things are slightly different. I'll get the limit as x approaches 10 from the negative side. If x is a little bit less than 10, so 9.99999 or something, and you take away 10, you have a negative number. Very small negative number, but a negative number nonetheless. And absolute values do something to negative numbers. In, I don't know, casual conversation, you might say they make them positive, which is true, Although mathematically, an easier way to describe it is they multiply them by negative one. So when you take the absolute value of negative three, your answer is positive three, but really what you did is you took the negative three and you multiplied it by negative one. My point is, since this thing inside the absolute value is negative, because x is a little bit less than 10, if I wanna drop the absolute value symbols and just write x minus 10, I better take into account the fact that that thing is negative, so the absolute value symbols multiply it by negative one. Now that the absolute value symbols are gone, I can cancel them out and say that this is the limit as x approaches 10 from the negative side of negative one. These two guys cancel out. And that limit is just equal to negative one. And so what that tells me is, so the limit as x approaches 10, the two-sided limit of this mess does not exist. Because this is different than this. A limit, a two-sided limit only exists if the two one-sided limits agree. All right, a little bit short on room, probably time too. Um, but I'll try to talk through this problem. It's similar, but not quite the same. We're still gonna break it up into two different limits. So we'll look at the limit as x approaches one from the positive side of this thing. 
and that is the limit as x approaches 1 from the positive side of if my value of x is a little bit bigger than 1, 1. 1.0001. Then I'm taking the absolute value of some number a little bit bigger than 1. I don't even care that it's bigger than 1, I just care that it's positive. What's inside the absolute value symbols up here is a positive number. And absolute value symbols don't do anything to positive numbers. They leave them alone. So I don't even need to write it. In the numerator, I just get x minus 1. In the denominator, sorry, there should be an absolute value there. If x is a little bit bigger than 1, I'm taking away a little bit more than I have. This is negative. 1 minus 1.0001 1 .0001 is a negative number. So if I want to drop the absolute value symbols, I better account for the fact that that's negative. So I get to there. Turns out that the numerator and the denominator here are the exact same. If you take this negative 1 and distribute it through, you get negative 1 plus x, which is the same as x minus 1. So what I get is that this is the limit as x approaches 1 from the positive side of the number 1, which is just equal to 1. I now look at the limit as x approaches 1 from the negative side. Careful here. You might think that, oh yeah, you need to do that negative trick here this time. Last time you just dropped the absolute value symbols, this time you don't. In fact, that's not the case. If x is approaching 1 from the negative side, we're a little bit less than 1. We're 0 0.99999. We're still positive. What's inside the absolute value symbol right here is still a positive number. If you're taking the absolute value of a positive number, absolute value is not doing a damn thing. Just drop it. However, down here, if you're taking away a little bit less than 1, 1 minus 0 0.99999, you're left with a positive number. And so this is positive maybe over here, this is positive. Um, and if it's positive, absolute value symbol is not doing anything. I get 1 minus x. All right, that should have been x minus 1 on the top. I just wrote the wrong thing. Um, and this, uh, let's see, these guys are not the same. They're similar, but they're not the same. In fact, the top is exactly the negative of the bottom. So I could say this is the negative of 1 minus x over 1 minus x, maybe. And I could say that that's the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the negative side of the number negative 1, which is negative 1. So once again, does not exist. Uh, the whole limit does not exist because the two one-sided limits don't agree. One is not the same as negative one, so this limit does not exist. Okay, that's the end of this.